Welcome to week seven of our licensing lunch and learn. Uh, glad to see lots of folks uh, been hanging with us for the entire series. This week, we are continuing to dive into the clinical exam content area. We have a very special guest and an expert in psychotherapy and <laughs> someone that I've known for quite a while. <laughs> Dr. Polly Everett is here uh, with us to walk you through psychotherapy, clinical interventions, and case management. And thank you again, Dr. Everett, for uh, taking time to work with our alumni. You're very welcome. Uh, if you have any questions of me, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, questions about what I do, how I do it, how long I've done it, any of that. And also certainly any questions that you might have about the material that we're going to discuss. So let's move ahead. So we've done the welcome and what we're gonna move into soon after that is review and practice questions, strategies for success, Q and A, and then we'll wrap up and I'll have some questions for you to move forward with um, as you uh, move forward thinking about what is it that you in particular need to know, need to focus on to help you do um, your very best in, um, in preparing for and taking the exam. It was a little longer than I wanted it to be, but I wanted to give you the idea that so much of what we think about and how we perform has to do with our sense of ourselves. We've all heard of the placebo effect, and we know that that's when someone is giving some a sugar pill instead of a pill with actual medicine, and the person starts to feel better. There's another concept, and I only read of it recently. It's called nocebo, and nocebo is the opposite effect. It's when you're given something and it has a negative impact. So you don't expect it. In other words, you don't expect it to do well. Sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy and consequently it doesn't. So part of doing well on an exam, this one or any other, is already having that belief in yourself that by doing whatever it takes that you're going to be able to make a difference in how you show up and how successful you are. So I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. So in this exam, in this section of psychotherapy, clinical intervention and case management, it makes up 27% of the exam questions in those categories. So that's what you can kind of expect and maybe take that into consideration when you're doing your preparation and your study. Now, there are things to consider when you're taking the exam, and maybe some of these you've heard before, and perhaps some of them are new, but I think it can bear repeating. So factors to consider when answering the questions. Best answer means out of all the answers that are listed, you want to choose the most appropriate. Um, the ideal situation might not be available, and that's important to remember that sometimes the the best best won't be there, but the best that is among your options is there. And that's the one you just wanna choose. Um, the ideal situation, again, may not be available, but of the choices at your disposal, which choice is best? Furthermore, the best answer encompasses aspects of all the potential interventions. Best and most are synonymous on the test. So you might see best or you might see most, depending on the structure of the question. You also want to consider what type of questions are answered, are you being asked to answer? Service delivery questions, ethics, assessment, diagnosis, human behavior, et cetera. And always consider whether confidentiality has been observed, because that can be key to some of the questions and they're considering whether you're considering that. And again, if you have any questions about any of this, please put your questions in the chat and, and we will get to them so that we can make it as interactive as possible. Okay. 
So next stop. The most common answers focus on, right? And this I found in preparation for this, that this is very, very important. Assessing before you treat. Now, that maybe stands with reason that before you intervene, you want to assess. So we've all heard that. I want you to be very sensitive to that when it comes to answering your questions. Building a relationship comes first. Right? Or focusing on clients' affect first, or dealing with basic needs before psychological needs. So see each of these as standalone and separate. When you're looking at a question, if it's asking you to treat before you assess, then that's not going to be the quick, uh, correct response. If building relationship is a part of what's in that question, you want to realize how that comes before going with a response that may have you treating before you assess or build the relationship. Dealing with basic needs are always going to supersede the psychological needs. So I think that'll become clear as we move through and look at some of the questions. Further, you want to notice there's some key words that it can help to keep in mind when you're looking at your questions. And these things that you want to notice are in bold caps here. Most, first, next, and best. So those are cues that you want to be sensitive to. They are extremely important in determining the correct answer, the best answer but always be sure to pay close attention to what comes after that word, most, what, first, what, right? These words are just as important as the capitalized words that come after. So the first sample question that we have, and this time I am going to ask you to put your responses in the chat so we can just get a sense of how you're thinking and feeling, um, responding and hearing these questions. Okay, so let's just look in. No questions yet, just some greetings. So a couple expressed extreme anger at each other um, in the couple counseling session, the marital session. The social worker should first, so that's the first cue, right? First. Right? So what's the first thing the social worker should do? You have option A, explore the goals the anger is masking. B, clarify whether the, uh, each partner is willing to hear the other out. Acknowledge the anger each person has shown toward the other. And use the interview to probe for positive feelings each has for the other. Would you put some up? What comes up for you? What are your responses? Why don't you throw them in the chat and see, uh, give us a chance to see how you're thinking about this and, and what your response would be. Ah, someone says B or D. Okay, C, C. Anything else? So I'm gonna just assume that you all agree that it's B, C, or D, right? So let's take a look at that and see what the correct response is. The correct response is B. Now let's go back to the question. Okay, so some of you said C. Acknowledge the anger each partner has toward the other, right? Now, remember, first is the key here, right? All of these things are possible. But what you're wanting to look at is what's the first response the social worker should offer. So that is 
clarify whether each person is willing to hear the other. Now, why do you think that that would be considered the best first thing to do? The downtown Detroit partnership. Oh, go, um, I think it would be the first thing because if they're not willing to um, cooperate or even hear each other out, then the session is because the therapist cannot speak for them or it's not their responsibility to get to the root of they there to assess them and assist them, but not like say it is up to them. If they want help, then it's up to them to come forward and be even willing to get the help and receive the help from the therapist, not the therapist to initiate the help. Okay. All right. So it, it, that makes sense, doesn't it? So what you're really trying to do here, or so it seems to me, is start to clarify whether they're willing to do that, whether they're willing to be able to hear each other. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, some said C, acknowledge the anger each partner has toward the other. And that certainly is something that could happen during the session, right? It's not that that's an incorrect response. It's only incorrect, if you will, if we overlook first, right? Some said D, is that right? Did we have a, did we have a D response? Let's see if it's chat again. We did have a D response. Now thinking about my D might not be the best response to the question. Use the interview. Somebody maybe needs the silence. Yeah. Can you notice whether your mic is on? Use the interview to probe for positive feelings each um, has for the other. Now, if we go back to the earlier slide, and this I think can help you. Remember the most common answers focus on assessing need before you treat, building a relationship, focusing on the client's affect and dealing with basic needs. Can anybody see how that applies to um, the question we were looking at? What does, what does the response of clarifying, how does it fit with those important things to consider? Anybody? I think Melanie has her hand up, um, okay. her, her virtual hand up. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so, yes, I actually had a question because mm -hmm. if they're already in marital counseling, to me, that's an indication that they're will they're trying to work things out and they're you know so willing their willingness to hear each other. I guess I'm confused about that because they're in counseling. So am I taking a step back in answering the questions? Because you know, I guess maybe to like state the obvious, I'm I'm a little confused. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think you just answered it, Melanie. Right. That taking the step back to reestablish, because what are you doing there? You're taking a step back to reestablish your willingness to hear each other, because nothing's going to happen if that's not the case, right? Okay. Right? So, so in asking that and assessing that, you're almost inviting the couple into thinking about and reflecting on, we're here to do this work. The only way this work is really going to get done, none of those other things are going to be able to happen unless we demonstrate a willingness to hear the other, right? So it's foundational in a sense. Does that answer the question? It does. Thank you. You're welcome. And also thank you, Dr. Johnson, for your response in the chat. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. That absolutely, one partner had had been told that they had to come to the session. Um, sometimes people don't have a full understanding of what it looks like to be in therapy, even though in our introductory sessions, maybe we've gone over that. So it serves as a gentle reminder, right? We're going to have to listen to each other if we're willing and able to accomplish anything. Melanie? Micheline, I think, yeah. Yes, you, you said that correctly. Thank you. Um, what I was going to say was, 
I always look at it as even even in questions, this is just me. I don't know how anybody else would do it, but I always look at it as their their first session when you come in and I always look at it as the beginning. So when you come into the door, we always start something new. And they came in angry, so that's starting something new. So my first thing is let's clear that up. So clarification. So are you here to do this or are you here to do something else? What are you here for? That's that's how I look at it. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. I think it's an excellent response, right? We're starting anew. We're having to reestablish how we do this thing, right? So, and the doing this thing is to recommit to being willing to hear each other because nothing's going to happen if that doesn't happen, is it? Right? Very good. Thank you for your participation. I think it makes it richer and you all have so much to offer. I mean, all the responses that I've heard so far is spot on, right? Let's go to the next one. Yeah. So we already did the rationale. Why was B the best answer? Because we had to start anew. I'm going to steal that from you. We had to start anew. We had to reestablish the commitment to listen to each other. Now, sample question two. And I tried to pick questions that, that went back and forth between the best and the first. And I put them in bold because, again, drawing your attention to how key that's going to be to, to be able to identify the question, the answer that the test is, is looking for. When faced by a hostile client in an agency setting, it is best for the social worker to suggest that the client's attitude is making the situation worse. B, accept the client's hostility and talk about non-threatening topics. Set limits and structure on the interview session. Or D, acknowledge the client's feelings and encourage discussion of them. So once again, would you put your responses in the chat and let's see where we all are with this one. I'll give you a second to do that. Oh, got some. Okay. So we've got D, we've got D, all right, what else is going on here? D, all right, D seems to win, all right. Let's see what we have here. Ta-da, all right. Now, it's gonna back up to that. What makes D the best answer in this question? Yes, Bella. In my opinion, if they already hostile, sometimes when you acknowledge and make them feel like they're important, because when people come to people in need or help or whatever circumstances, they pretty much have them like to me a tantrum or they trying to get some out and something to trouble them. So when you acknowledge them, whether it's negative or positive behavior, you acknowledge them and sometimes that'll shock them because they probably used to negative reinforcement. So once you acknowledge them and they feel like somebody as of nobody, then they will calm down and then they're willing to listen and y'all can move forward, in my opinion. Okay, all right. So the acknowledgement makes a difference perhaps in being able to help the client regulate, shall we say. Any other? Yeah, instead of feeding it with negative against negative because it's not going to get resolved so fueling the fire or something like that i just feel acknowledge them and maybe they could kind of calm down because they feel not i matter i mean that'd be the first approach and if they get beyond that i don't know but for the question that's my answer for this question for now <laughs> okay so a suggest the client's attitude is making the situation worse what's likely to happen if you do that yes Bella. Okay, you said suggest that the client's attitude is making the situation worse? Yeah, looking at some of the alternative answers to this question, I wonder why you, we wouldn't suggest that A is the answer. Uh, 
um, let's say one face, but it's not stop. I mean, they already suggested the clients add to it. Maybe we already have a hostile client, so we know that whatever they do, they, they're going to make it worse. So we're trying to intervention and try to calm them down. They're hostile, so anything they're doing is going to make it worse. But we have to, like, help them to, like, bring them down. We're trying to talk them off the level to make things better. They sure. already came in the door wrong with the hostility. That's okay. in my opinion. So confrontation, I hear what in what I hear in what you're saying is that confrontation is not likely to make the situation any better. Is oh no. Oh no. Okay. They ready for that. They ready for that. <laughs> Looks like they came back in for bear, huh? Yeah, they oh. come they're ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have some other hands. Micheline. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um I look at it as when a person comes in the door, first of all, you was a, they're trying to get your attention. They're trying to let you know something is wrong with them. So my first thing to do with them is to acknowledge their name and then I'll do, you know, and, and, and address it in a way and keep acknowledging them until they recognize that, you know, the, the way it could calm them down. Am I saying that? Does that make sense to anybody? And then I can address them by just, you know, acknowledging them by saying their name first. And then I could just go on with that. And then I can, you know, calm them down. Okay. Okay. Right. So looking for ways to sort of de-escalate again, right? Is that the idea? That we yeah. want to do and act in any way that may help the client to de-escalate, get grounded, and be a little bit more open to the process. Shandia? Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Um, I agree with uh, both of the ladies' responses. Thank you for giving us the space to talk this out. I completely agree with them. I think that in terms of D being the selection, acknowledging the client's feelings, just being able to validate them. And I think that that's really healthy in building like that therapeutic rapport and process of, you know, having that relationship building step. When we were talking about the, the option that was incorrect, um, except, I'm sorry, suggested the client's attitude is making the situation worse. I think that that would just exacerbate the, the uh -huh. emotional level um, that they were experiencing at that time. And the goal is to give them a healthy baseline and to establish a healthy baseline. And that would not do that. <laughs> so I agree with both of the ladies' responses. Hey, you guys right. Okay. So here's no, number B. What do you all think about that? Accept the client's hostility and talk about non-threatening topics. Okay, is that Shandia? Whose hand is up? Oh, I'm so sorry. That was an accident. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what we have. All right, focus on the client's affect. Yeah, that goes back to something we had talked about a little earlier when we were looking at things to consider, right? Um, okay, so this question still, I'm curious as to what your thoughts are. Um, accept the client's hostility and talk about non-threatening topics. Why might that not be an effective way to approach it? Uh, Nicoletta? Did you have something? Okay, can you, yeah, I'm sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, with that approach, we accept the client's hostility and talk about non-threatening topics. In my opinion, I think that that would kind of be brushing the client off and not, you know, connecting with what where the hostility is coming from or finding out, you know, mm -hmm. what the client, you know, not validating that the client has something that they want to talk about. Ah, sort of like the client could easily in that situation maybe feel not seen and heard, right? Exactly, yeah. Ah. That. That, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bella? I just wanted to um, piggyback off what you and a young lady just said, pretty much not acknowledging them because even though hostility it is not the right way to approach certain things in certain circumstances. It's still emotion. 
So when you don't acknowledge or validate the, the uh, client and you accept the client's hostility, but talk about non-threatening topics, it's almost indirectly talking to them like you're talking that like down or through them, and you're not talk, you're not talking to them. So here they act hostile, and then you're gonna have a say, okay, we're gonna talk about hostile things. So you just like a slap in their face or something like we talking about non-threatening topics, and they come in hostile. So what are you doing, taunting me, or what are you trying to do, like? So that's not reprimanding them like they a child or something. You're not mm -hmm. acknowledging or vows. Uh, is an emotion they can't. They got their choice to embrace it. Don't mean we have to accept it or be cooperative with them. But it's another way to do it because they're coming in. Something is going on. Something needs to be addressed. You know, obviously. But it's a way to do it. And we are. They looking for help. They seeking help or something. And we are the ones there to help them. So we have to show them in a different way, but still make sure they're comfortable. And we um, respecting their um, space and stuff and letting them know that we see that you're angry. We see you crying out for help and we're here to help you. We're not against you. We're with you and for you. Right. And you know, you said that part, we're with you and, and, and we're here to help you. So we're not saying that you can't bring that into the room, are we? Right. No judging, but we, right. you know, it's just not. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So <laughs> switch topic, if I ignore the fact <clears throat> that you're feeling and displaying in some ways your hostility and I move to a non-threatening topic, I wonder if that doesn't say to the client, that's not okay here. You can't bring that emotion into the room, right? Because I'll just ignore it if you do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Nicoletta? Yeah, I just wanted to add to to that as far as not acknowledging the um, hostility, you know, we want to try to change the thought process as therapists. So if I can't talk about where the hostility is coming from, then I can't provide the client with a different thought process on handling whatever issues that they may be having. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I couldn't ask for a better set of responses to that. You guys ready to write the test questions? Okay, let's see what else we have here. All right, so we did that. Okay, now here's a different type of question. And I wanted to include this because you will see questions in these various formats. So here we have, this is an incomplete statement example, right? So alcohol is a hallucinogen, a stimulant, a depressant, or a hypnotic. Answers in the chat, please. Okay, all right. Uh huh. Okay. Anybody think anything other than C? Okay. Ta da. <laughs> so now we got somebody up here. What's this? Uh, B. Okay. All right. The correct answer is C. But let's take a look at B and see why maybe B could have felt like it was the right answer. I have some thoughts, but I'd like to hear from who else thought that B might be the correct answer. And remember now we're talking the best answer, okay? Okay, I'll go first, so I'll put B. I thought stimulant would be because the stimulant is when it's rushing something, like when they be sweating, sometimes they be sweaty where they overworking some of them talk fast they do get depressed after the fact but we're going to stay on stimulant but the way they reaction is before they come down but when they go on they moving fast and they acting out of character the, i have witnessed certain people who like ingest alcohol and how the, the actions i go on but seeing that i'm not a doctor but it's just like they, the sweaty part the fast movement so it's like been hyper and just out of character so that's why i chose the stimulant 
anybody in our group today um, in substance abuse, work in substance abuse, placed in substance abuse? No? Okay. Well, this is interesting, and this is why I wanted to hear from whoever wrote stimulant, because it's a tricky thing. It's a biological process, number one, right? So this is a factual question as opposed to some of the others which have to do with judgment. So alcohol can first hit the body and give a boost, right? It's sort of like eating sugar. And then what happens is it settles down and becomes a depressant. So it's primarily a depressant if you look at the effect it has on the body. Make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. Yes, now that you put it that way. Yep. I'm gonna assume it does until you have until you all tell me differently. <laughs> And the why of that, I believe, is again, as we were saying, it's a factual thing. This, is a, this has to do with bio biology and what we know about the effects of the substance of alcohol in our bodies. All right. <clears throat> so this is the fourth question. You, you, you guys are just really, you, you got this, I think. During an intake session, a client is unable to provide several details needed to complete a psychosocial history. The social worker obtains the client's consent to contact family members for additional information. What term best describes the type of information that will be obtained in consulting with that family member? Again, please put your responses in the chat. Okay, let's start taking a look. Okay. Okay. Anybody else wanna take a shot at it? Uh-huh. Okay. So, got two Ds. All right, well, let's take a look and see what the test would want from you in response to this. So this is the rationale, right? D is the correct response, collateral, and here's why. In this scenario, the social worker has obtained permission from the client to gather needed information from family members to sub <clears throat> excuse me, to supplement what has already been provided. The information from family members is best described as collateral information or information about the client provided by others. A, <clears throat> as a response, is typically called statistical data drawn from conclusions based on reasoning. Right. Wait, just a go back to this a second. Um, so the best answer is D. Let me go up one and let you take a look at that again. So collateral simply means that this is information that's gathered from other sources. It's not diagnosed, not diagnostic. You can't base a diagnosis, right, on information that you just gathered from someone else. It takes a lot more information to be able to make uh, a diagnosis. It's certainly not objective. We have no more reason to believe that the report of the family member is any more objective than the report of the, um, the client. It's not inferential. You're not inferring. You're doing, it's collateral. It's gathering information from other sources. Let's go to the chat and see what you all have to say about that. Are there any questions about that? Is that clear? 
Yes, it's clear for me. No questions at this time. Okay. Let's do five. Oh, there was more. Okay. In this scenario, the social worker has obtained permission from the client to gather needed information from family members to supplement what has already been provided. Um, the information from family members is best described as collateral information or information about the client provided by others. A is typically statistical data drawn from conclusions based on reasoning. That's objective. It's factual, right? As much as something can be. All right. So I think we covered that. Now here's five. I was going to send you off into breakout rooms for that, but <clears throat> maybe it seems to be working pretty good with all of us just staying together in the together in this. So we'll just continue that way. A social worker meets with a client who is concerned about frequently leaving tasks unfinished. <laughs> this behavior has resulted in family conflict and job loss. To further assess this behavior, what should the social worker do next? A, discuss options that might diminish the behavior. Excuse me. B, explore factors that have contributed to the behavior. C, help the client identify personal strategies for problem solving. And finally, D, evaluate the client's motivation for changing the behavior. Once again, let's have your answers in the chat and see where we are with this. In the chat. Okay, we've got a D, a B, and a C. Okay. Interesting. Any others want to chime in? Okay. B. Okay. Let's go through them together and see if we can problem solve ourselves through this. Discuss options that might diminish the behavior. Okay. Okay, so why might that not be the first thing that we would want to do? Or the next thing we want to do after the client has reported that to us? Um, because it's asking to, the question asks for us to further assess the behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're in the process of assessing still, right? And this one begins to move in. A begins to move where? Into what? Treatment. Uh-huh, I would say so. And again, I want you all to keep this in mind. It's going to be very helpful to you. Can you see why? Assessing first before you treat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Assess first, build relationship first, focus on affect first, dealing with basic needs before psychological needs. So if there's one slide in all of this that I would suggest you focus on or that you take some notes on, it would be this one, because I think it serves as a good guide to help you remember and think about first things first. What do we have? Yes, yes. I haven't gotten to the root of the behavior and as to why. So let's go back to that question again. So we've talked about why. Um, okay, 
Yeah. So we've talked about why A wouldn't necessarily be the best answer because we're moving in the direction of treating, right? Um, we don't know yet all that's going on. So it'd be premature to begin coming up with options about how to diminish the treatment. B, explore factors that have contributed to the behavior, right? Help the client identify personal strengths for problem solving. I think based on what we just said, can you see how that would be akin to number A or letter A, how it would be similar in that we're, we're out ahead of ourselves a little bit? Does anybody get that or see? Yes. All right. Evaluate the client's motivation for changing the behavior. Okay. So the answer is B. And here we have it. What is the primary purpose of contracting between a social worker and a client? To ensure that the client will follow the social worker's plan. To define who will be responsible for which assigned task and to meet the requirements. Why is B the best answer? The question requires an understanding of the purpose of contracting with the client. A contract's primary purpose is to provide clarity on tasks to be accomplished and who will be responsible for each. While some agencies may require contracting as part of their documentation policies, C is not its primary purpose. The treatment plan should be considered a joint plan, not a social worker's plan that a client must follow. Okay, so what I'm going to invite you all to do, and it sounds like you're in a very good place based on those who responded and spoke up, and thank you very much for doing that. You contribute in a major way um, to the learning here today, is identify strategies you will adopt to help you prepare for the the uh, exam beyond what you've done in, in taking this series of courses. Identify when you will begin. It's so important not just to say I'm going to do, but to, to, to add a little muscle to saying you're going to do by saying when you're going to do it. Identify what strategies, maybe specifically which strategies work best for you to help you and why it's important. You know, in coaching, one of the things that's very important that we've learned is that if you can say why, right, why this is important, because without the why, you can lose some of the, the, the motivation, some of the juice, some of the energy behind doing a thing. Okay. So we just really have a minute left here. It went by much quicker than I thought. Um, but this is what I see for all of you. Right? <laughs> Um, in your future. Any last question or questions that we can take a minute to, to sort of speak to? I don't have a question. I just want to thank you so much for your presentation. And I did enjoy the time and engine that I could. <laughs> and the way you explain each step after we answer it, you went back over it with us and made us look at it a different way on perspective of why we answer how we did, acknowledge how we, like our perspective, and then showed us like what was, was right or wrong. And my my fall off is overthinking. I'm always overthinking because I always put the right answer in there, but I said and or. So if mm -hmm. I could go with my first mind, then I'll be okay. So I'm gonna work on my overthinking. So everyone yeah. enjoy the rest of y'all evening. Thank you everyone for putting in as a group and helping us move forward to succeed. So y'all enjoy our weekend. Thank y'all so much. Let me piggyback on that and say absolutely the same for me. Enjoy your weekend. You are all the little engines that could. And I look forward to seeing you active and participating in our career of choice.